Did you know that two out of every three guys are going to experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? You probably do now, because it's true. For me, it was much earlier. I was 25. Sad, sad days. I wish Keeps had been around when I was younger because advancements in science meant that there are now treatments that can combat the symptoms of hair loss and help you keep the hair that you have. Look, it's too late for me. My hair is not coming back. But you don't have to be like me. You can stop your hair loss early thanks to Keeps. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved drugs for treating hair loss, so you might have tried them before, but never at a price this low. That's right. If you were thinking this is some sort of medicine, it's going to be expensive, or you couldn't be more wrong. Keeps starts are just $10 a month. How does it work? Well, for one thing, no need to visit a doctor's office. Just schedule a quick online consult and a bit later, a discreet package will arrive at your door and you can use it in the privacy of your own home. So, if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, that's one problem that's not going to fix itself. Do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash biographics or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. And now, today's video. For a generation of Haitians, it was Terra Incarnate, a living version of Baron Samadhi, the voodoo lower of cemeteries and father of the dead. Backed by his child-stealing boogeyman, the Tonton Makut, he presided over the land for 14 dark years, like some evil spirit made flesh. But despite his pretensions to the contrary, Papadoc was no spirit, no mystical figure. Rather, he was a man of flesh and blood, just like any other, with one major exception. Behind his kindly seeming face and slight frame lay a soul so sadistic, so casually cruel, that it would inflict pain and misery upon millions. As president of Haiti, Francois Duvalier oversaw a regime of fear unlike anything the Caribbean has ever seen. Under his watch, up to 60,000 were murdered, thousands more were tortured or driven from their homes all while the rest of society plunged into soul-crushing poverty. In today's episode, Biographics is investigating how a gentle-seeming doctor wound up becoming absolute ruler of his country and the nightmares he unleashed. When Francois Duvalier was born in Haiti's capital of Port-au-Prince on April the 14th, 1907, there was nothing to suggest it ever amount to anything, much less become leader of his nation. His family were bitterly poor, as members of Haiti's Creole-speaking black majority tended to be. Part of a vast underclass ruled by a tiny French-speaking light-skinned elite. Yet it wouldn't just be life on the margins that came to define Duvalier's upbringing, but also events. Because young Francois had been born just in time to experience one of Haiti's defining eras, the American occupation. Since achieving independence from France in 1804, Duvalier's nation had spent a century being battered by forces both internal and external. Within Haiti itself, there had been corruption, coups, and assassinations, while from the outside, France had imposed a crippling debt on its breakaway colony that sapped the young nation. Even so, as the end of the 19th century arrived, there had been signs that things were looking up. After many turbulent decades, society was stabilizing, local culture was flourishing, and vast inequality aside, Side, trade was picking up. But then Uncle Sam came knocking and everything immediately went to hell. This was the era of great American interference in the Caribbean. In 1905, the U.S. had seized control of the Customs House of the Dominican Republic, the other nation sharing the island of Hispaniola with Haiti. So when Haiti began one of its regular slides towards chaos, Washington was right there to make things worse. Starting in 1911, a series of revolutions and coups deposed seven Haitian presidents in four years sparking American worries that Haiti would default on its debts. In fact, they got so worried that in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson ordered the seizure of the nation's gold reserves, transferring them to New York. But rather than calm the chaos, that robbery only exacerbated it. Like to a crazy extreme. On July the 28th, 1915, the Haitian president, Vilbrun Guillaume Sam, was lynched by a furious mob. Just hours later, Wilson ordered Marines into Port-au-Prince. Soon, 5,000 US soldiers had landed on Haiti, establishing an occupation. It was meant to last until order was restored. Instead, the US presence would wind up dragging on for 19 long years. For Francois de Vallier, that meant growing up in a city and a nation brutalized by an occupying force. Coming from a U.S. that was going through what's been called America's nadir of race relations, many of the Marines brought their racism with
with them. That meant things like the Kays massacre when US soldiers opened fire into a crowd of demonstrators killing 12 people. It meant things like scores of political dissidents being executed. But the Americans' attitudes also showed themselves in more insidious yet equally damaging ways. A major one was the elevation of the already rich, light-skinned elite into most positions of power, further widening the gap between French speakers and the Creole majority. Another was the corvée system, which saw tens of thousands of black Haitians made to work as forced laborers, a state of affairs that saw perhaps 5,000 die from mistreatment. In short, the Americans took the poisonous divides that already existed in Haitian society and stretched them until the bonds holding the nation together simply snapped. So when Francois de Vallier steps into politics in the near future, promising a Haiti that is unashamedly for the black Creoles, he's gonna get an extremely sympathetic hearing. But all of that for another chapter. For now, we'll leave off with FDR pulling the plug on the intervention in 1934, just as Duvalier is graduating from the University of Haiti School of Medicine. As someone from a poor background, qualifying as a doctor must have felt like a great achievement. Armed with his new life, Duvalier immediately began working in hospitals. But he soon began consorting with a group of writers who'd been radicalized by the long occupation. He'd come out convinced that a rigid black nationalism was Haiti's only way forward, and they shared another trait to a deep interest in voodoo. As a religion that rose out of the slave trade's forced mingling of cultures, voodoo had long been an integral part of Haitian society. While the city dwellers, including Duvalier, tended to be Catholics, out in the Haitian countryside, voodoo was everywhere. Whole swathes of the nation seeped in practices alien to the American occupiers. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why Duvalier's circle was so keen on it, as the clearest signal that Haiti lived a distinct spiritual life. But Duvalier also had other reasons for being interested in voodoo. One's that were far less spiritual and far more practical. Jump forward to the early 1940s in the United States program to try and eradicate yours in Haiti. A disfiguring skin disease that mainly affects children, yours is one of those nasty things like polio that the world would be better without. And while the US eradication effort would fail, Washington would damn well try recruiting Haitian doctors to go to remote villages and administer shots. Among their number was Francois de Vallier. It was from these years of traveling Haiti's fields and scaling its mountains armed with medicine that Papa Doc got his nickname. He was bringing relief to long-neglected areas. But it was also these years that showed him how immersed in voodoo the black majority were, how important it was to their lives. And just as other aspiring dictators might align themselves with powerful Christian or Muslim figures, Duvalier began to cultivate ties with regional Ungans, voodoo's male priests. It seemed benign at this point, just a gentle doctor making friends with religious leaders as he tended their villages. But really, Duvalier was laying the groundwork for his next great step into politics. As the 1940s passed, Papa Doc worked to raise his profile, becoming the head of the anti-yours campaign, then Director General of Haiti's Health Service. In 1948, he finally got the promotion he'd been dreaming of, becoming Secretary of Labor under President de Marseille's Estime. But if de Valier had assumed his next step would be into the presidential palace, well, fate was about to send him tumbling back to the bottom of the entire staircase. In 1950, President Estime announced that he had grown rather fond of being in charge and wouldn't be stepping down at the end of his term. To which the military replied, uh-uh, not happening. They overthrew him and installed Colonel Paul E. Magloire. Although black himself, Magloire was a puppet of the light-skinned elites. Under his watch, Haiti threw its arms open to international tourists, even as it all but barred Creoles from public life. But for Duvalier, that meant expulsion from Haiti's corridors of power, returning to private practice almost as if his jump into politics had never happened. But now he had had the faintest taste of power, there was no way Duvalier could go back to being a mere doctor again. Instead, he became involved in the anti-Magloire resistance. Years later, this era would become a key part of Duvalier's myth, a source of romantic legends and funny stories like how he evaded Magloire's goons by disguising himself as a woman. On a practical level, though, this period also saw two very important moments. The first was the birth of Papa Doc's son, Jean-Claude Duvalier, better known as Baby Doc. The second was the relationship that he established with another resistance leader, Clément Barbeau. A one-time school teacher turned full-time sociopath, Barbeau would later become key to enforcing Duvalier's blood-soaked rule. But first they needed to get rid of Magloire. Fortunately, Mother Nature was about to lend a helping hurricane. In the fall of 1954, Hurricane Hazel came crashing into Haiti, trailing devastation. Rather than help the afflicted communities, Magloire allowed his cronies to siphon off the relief funds, standard practice 
for a corrupt regime. But the response was anything but standard. Outraged, the population turned on the president. Although he managed to cling to power until 1956, a wave of strikes and protests eventually forced him to flee the country. What followed was a dizzying series of six caretaker administrations, each one more chaotic and shorter lived than the last. Eventually, though, it became clear that no caretaker was going to navigate Haitians out of this growing crisis, that an election was needed to install a legitimate leader, one who could restore order to an ever more lawless country. And restore order, the 1957 election absolutely would, but only at the cost of something far dearer than stability. Freedom. All his life, Papa Doc was convinced the number 22 was his lucky charm. So, when the 1957 election was announced for September 22nd, he may have assumed he'd therefore win. If he did, he was the only one. Although Duvalier entered the election a known quantity, a former politician who'd helped topple Magloire's corruptocracy, he was far from the frontrunner. He was just too gentle, the sort of president you could picture being overthrown by the Girl Scouts. The one issue that he did have strong opinions on, unashamed black nationalism, was also the exact sort of thing that should cause all the elites to try and discredit him. As the campaign wore on, though, it soon became clear that all these handicaps might actually be strengths. Take the good doctor's naivety. While it might have seemed like Duvalier wouldn't make a strong leader, that was exactly what many wanted. The military, for instance, began to bag Duvalier, apparently thinking they could use him as a puppet. The light-skinned elites, too, looked at the slight, bespectacled man talking about making the economy run for the black majority and basically went, that guy threaded us? <laughs> Please. Nor was it just Haiti's powerful who failed to see the dark heart of Francois de Valier. Across Haiti, many still remembered him as the doctor who'd cured their village of yours. He was liked, trusted. Even in a fair election, he may have won. But with the all-powerful military now putting their thumb on the scales, Papadoc's path to the presidency was sealed. Election day saw de Valier sweep the board, netting over 72% of the vote and capturing the Chamber of Deputies. A month later, on October the 22nd, the new president gave an inaugural speech where he declared, My my government will scrupulously protect the honor and civil rights which constitute the joy of all free peoples. It was exactly the sort of thing everybody expected to hear from a man who'd made his career as a doctor. Barely had the cheering stopped, though, before Duvalier revealed himself as Lesser Patch Adams and more a Dr. Hannibal Lecter. Within weeks of taking up the presidency, Duvalier had ordered his political opponents jailed on spurious charges. Now, this wasn't super unexpected in a corrupt place like Haiti, but the violence which accompanied it was on a whole other level. On Duvalier's orders, the former school teacher Clement Barbeau had spent the last few months recruiting tough men as a private paramilitary force. Now they descended on those who'd stood against Duvalier in 1957. They attacked them, they tortured them, they purged them from society. Before a year was up, 300 people had been murdered, including children. But it was what came next which really sealed Papa Doc's reputation. Around the time of his first anniversary in power, part of the military seems to have woken up to how bloodthirsty their so-called puppet was. Vague plans were played for a coup, plans Duvalier's men managed to disrupt before they got anywhere. Yet the mere threat of being overthrown was still enough to make Papa Doc pivot from his army backers, to turn those thugs Barbo had recruited into his own secret police force. Known as the Tonton Makut, they would bring terror to the heart of Haiti. Based on the Haitian boogeyman said to stuff children into his gunny sack, then eat them for breakfast, the Tonton Makut were masters of both image and indiscriminate violence. Image because they usually appeared wearing shiny dark suits, eye hiding sunglasses and stylish hats, dressing like dead gangsters returned to life. And violence because, well, just listen to some of the atrocities that they committed. As Duvalier's goons, the Makut didn't just kill people, they slaughtered them, burning them alive or stoning them to death before dumping their bodies in marketplaces as a warning. Rather than pay them, Duvalier and Barbo allowed them to make money on the side however they wished with complete immunity from the law. The result was violence so random that no one knew who might be next. Old and young, rich and poor, light-skinned and dark, could all find themselves dragged away to be beaten, tortured, or murdered for sport. Extortion, robbery, and blackmail became just facts of life. And then there was what the Makut did to women. Without dwelling on the details, the complete free reign these sadistic youths had around Port-au-Prince gave rise to a tidal wave of sexual assault. But what did Francois de Valier care? With his Tonton Makut now numbering 10,000, the dictator had already broken any hold the army might have had over him. From now, his hidden, cruel side would be fully unleashed, and the result would be a humanitarian tragedy.
As the regime took suffocating hold, Papa Doc began to cultivate a new personality, one that went beyond the standard dictator model of uniformed dude in sunglasses, possibly with moustache, and into something far stranger. Duvalier began to purposely model himself on Baron Samedi. A spirit of the graveyards, Baron Samedi is an integral part of Haitian voodoo's cosmology, a trickster eternally reminding the living of their fate. But while his role in voodoo is not to instill fear, that's exactly how Papa Doc used his likeness. He deliberately dressed like the Guardian of Cemeteries, complete with suit, top hat, and cane. Like the Tonton Makut channeling a creature of folklore, it was an intimidation tactic. But it was also a sign. By stepping into the role of a voodoo spirit, Duvalier was signifying his connection to Haiti's religion, showing the influential Ungans that he was one of them, that they could support him. Not that the freakiness of his new personality hurt his hold on power. Encouraged by the regime, rumors sprang up that the Tonton Makut were zombies Papa Doc had raised from the dead. Others claimed he ate the hearts of his murdered enemies and thus gained their strength. That he could cast spells, bringing the severed heads of rebels back to life to interrogate at leisure. As time went on, there's evidence Duvalier began to believe his own hype, at one point telling associates he was invulnerable. Yet when death came knocking, it wouldn't be Baron Samedi that saved Papadoc's life, but Uncle Sam. Like many others during the occupation, the young doctor had learned that the U.S. was a force to be reckoned with, that no regime could survive without Washington's backing. So, when he took power in 1957, Duvalier made sure to combine severe repression at home with some good old-fashioned ass-kissing abroad. Casting himself as an anti-communist bulwark, Papa Doc wowed Washington so spectacularly that Uncle Sam was soon throwing millions of dollars at him. While this allowed the regime to consolidate its power and embark on harebrained schemes like trying Trying to build a new model city named Duvalierville, the real advantage came in 1959. That year, Duvalier suffered a heart attack that nearly killed him. In another universe, perhaps it would have. In this universe, though, America responded by flying in specialists to help nurse him back to health, all while the Makut bombed newspaper offices and tortured dissidents. It took ages, but finally, after enjoying the best medical support American money could buy, Papa Doc returned to the presidency. And at that point, he immediately went back to being an award-winning with Duvalier out of action, his old loyalist Barbo had become acting president. Now, though, the rejuvenated dictator accused his friend of planning to supplant him and ordered him thrown in jail for 16 months. Not long after, he staged a phony election, despite still having two years left in office, announced that he'd won 100% of the vote, and claimed an illegal second term. It was this last bit, more than anything, that finally got Washington to reel in the aid that it was sending to Papa Dog. But even now, the CIA didn't try to topple him. They might no longer be willing to fund his regime, but so long as Duvalier was publicly flipping the commies the bird, the Americans didn't give a damn what he did. And what the good doctor wanted to do now was terrify even his loyal supporters. Throughout his reign, Papa Doc relied on random cruelty to keep people in line, not just with the opportunistic targeting of civilians by the Makuts, but also by frequently sending once-cherished aides to be tortured for no rhyme or reason. In 1963, though, this repression of his supporters reached new heights. That spring, Clément Barbeau, now out of prison, tried to get his revenge on Duvalier by kidnapping his son, Baby Doc. The ambush on the Charles Chauffeur car killed three people, but ultimately failed. Rather than sate Barbeau's thirst for vengeance, it instead sparked a blood-soaked backlash. When news reached Papa Doc, he ordered 65 of his own officers immediately executed in case they were tempted to join Barbeau. He then ordered every black dog in the country shot, playing on a local room that Barbo was capable of turning into a black dog to escape assassins. Finally, he had the Makut corner Barbo and his followers in a sugarcane field and set the crop on fire. Those who stayed burned to death. Those who tried to run were unceremoniously gunned down. It was the last time anyone in his inner circle tried to stand up to Duvalier. From that day on, even his closest allies kept their heads down. Sadly, that wouldn't save them. As the 1970s dawned, it was on a Haiti now firmly under Pap Doc's faux voodoo spell. Back in 1964, Duvalier had done what all tyrants eventually do and had himself declared president for life. What followed had been the birth of a personality cult so preposterous even Kim Jong-un would find it tasteless. With Duvalier firmly in charge, the Lord's Prayer was rewritten. Its opening line changed to, Our Doc, 
who art in the National Palace, hallowed be thy name. This despite the Vatican excommunicating him from the church. Not that it stopped Duvalier attending, he still went every Sunday, only now surrounded by armed men just daring the priest to throw him out. Then there was the grandiose title he bestowed upon himself, one that proclaimed him incorruptible leader of the great majority of the Haitian people, renovator of the Republic, chief of the revolution, and spiritual father of the nation. As if to prove his popularity, villagers were shipped in from all over the country and made to dance outside the palace, crying his name and cheering. It was an absurd sham, an entire nation mobilized to soothe one man's fragile ego. Yet behind the spectacle lay nothing but violence and sadism. In this era, teenagers who spoke against the regime were executed with shocking regularity. Closer to the palace, Duvalier began personally leading the firing squads that disposed of allies that he believed had slighted him. It was even said that he had peepholes cut into the walls of torture chambers so that he could watch as the Tonton Magoot abused their victims. The Haiti the 1970s dawned on then was an oppressive, nightmarish place, a land soaked in blood. Yet it was also a place about to undergo seismic change. Ill with diabetes, Papa Doc had always appeared older than his age, looking frail and elderly despite being barely 60. Now, even as his power increased, his health began to slide. In November 1970, a second heart attack left him weaker than before. Sadly, though, the death of the Patriarch wouldn't bring Haiti relief, but only more of the same. In February of 1971, Duvalier forced through a constitutional change, eliminating age requirements for the presidency. That done, he named his 19-year-old son Baby Doc his heir. A dumb, well-fed oaf of a playboy, Jean-Claude Duvalier looked even less of a likely president than his dad. Just like his old pa, though, he'd cling on to power for a long time, backed by a brutality that would have made Papa Doc proud. Not that the older tyrant would be around to witness it. A mere two months after sorting out his succession, Francois de Valier died of heart disease on April 21, 1971. He was 64 years old. At the moment he died, Papa Doc was Haiti's longest-serving leader since President Jean-Pierre Boyer fled into exile in 1843. Yet, what had his 13-plus years got in his nation? 90% of the population was illiterate. Those with means and education had all fled, resulting in a massive brain drain. Per capita income was just $75 per year, making Haiti one of the poorest nations on earth. Even Duvalier's signature youthful achievement had been reversed. With so much poverty around, yours had come roaring back along with a wave of malnutrition. And then there were the deaths. Today, it's estimated between 30,000 and 60,000 Haitians were murdered by the Duvalier regime, on top of the hundreds of thousands tortured, forced into exile, or sexually assaulted. That's a total few other tyrants in the Americas could even dream of, high enough to make the Duvalier regime one of the deadliest seen in the post-World War II Western Hemisphere. Sadly for Haitians, there would never be any justice. Today, Haiti is still a nation struggling with the after-effects of Duvalier's long rule. The majority are still crushed by extreme poverty, a poverty they were plunged into under Duvalier, which subsequent leaders have failed to save them from. In a way, perhaps this is Haiti's greater tragedy, that those who came after Papa and Baby Doc never managed to repair their wounded land. In many cases, they never even tried. But for all Haiti may suffer a chronic lack of good leaders and a United States that constantly intervenes, there can be no doubting who should shoulder the most blame. As leader, Francois Duvalier brutalized his people, ruining their lives, their prospects, and their economy, even as he showered himself with ever more ludicrous titles. Often in these videos, we try to find some nuance in our subjects, a spark of good among even the worst, a hint of cruelty and even the greatest. But there can be no nuance when discussing Papa Doc, nothing else to say, except that he was a shallow, callous man who did no good in the world, and far too much bad. That his legacy lives on while so many of his victims are forgotten is nothing short of a tragedy.